On behalf of our board and the artists we serve, we're proud to present you with our Maverick Spirit Award. Congratulations. I'm a student of film, and I'm a student of film noir, and I'm a student of Roman noir, and, I'm, and so I, I, with Mystic River, what it was was I started to think about what are the underpinnings of American crime fiction. They are that there is a there is a lone wolf who works outside of society because society is broken to fix the ills that society is either too corrupt or or too stupid or just not interested in fixing. And he does, and that's that's essentially the American crime fiction. Um, uh, myth. And I thought, that's great, but what if the guy's wrong? What if the guy's wrong? That was the entire thing about Mystic River, was I'm really tired of the American myth, to be honest with you. I think it's a bullshit myth. And I think it gets us into a lot of trouble, and it gets us into a lot of bad wars, and it gets us into a lot of bad places. And it's this idea of violence, uh, you know, regeneration through violence, which never works. You know, violence just basically causes more violence. So... Mystic River is this idea of here's our classic noir hero, here's what he's doing, we're rooting for him all the way to the end, and then the point is, yeah, he was wrong. Yeah. Um, my, when I talk about process, I think that happened organically. As the book was going on, all of a sudden I said, what am I really, what am I really angry about here? Oh, I'm angry about this myth, you know? Yeah. Um, but when I set out to write a book, no, I just sort of, I have a bunch of characters, I start with characters, and then I have them walk around, and then they meet other characters. And then after a while, they all kind of come back to me, and they say, shouldn't we be kind of doing something right now? Yeah. And I, and I kind of go, yeah, go get me a plot. Would you go? And they usually they go out, and they're usually really cool. And they come back after like a month or two, and they have a story for me. There's two things at play there. One, I think I'm contrary by nature. I think it's just, it's just a natural instinct in me that if you – there's a line in one of my books that I think is probably the truest line I ever wrote about me, and I put it in about another character, and it's, um, your problem is that you always see the best and the worst of the people and the worst and the best of people. My favorite line about process is from Apocalypse Now. There's a moment where um, Kurtz says to Willard, he says, what's the matter, Willard? Don't you approve of my method? And, and Willard looks around and he says, I don't see any method anywhere, sir. And that's really my process. Uh, but we just follow, our job was to follow their vision, and we did. And it, and it is. It, there's zero wish fulfillment in the, in the wire. There's always, if you look carefully, even in the most cynical American work, you usually find wish fulfillment. It's there somewhere. There is none in the wire. I would, say, I would argue there is none in the wire, and there is none in Game of Thrones. Those are the two television shows that I've come across in history. But there is zero wish fulfillment. There is zero romanticism in the worst sense of that word. All of you who are writers in here, let me tell you that, that the base thing that should always be there, in my opinion. Um, in my opinion, you shouldn't do anything unless you have in your heart this feeling of, my dad's got a barn, let's put on a show. It, you should do it for the love of doing it. You shouldn't do it for the paycheck because... Ultimately, you probably won't get the paycheck anyway if you're in film or TV. Trust me. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you'll do shitty work. It's as simple as that. Nobody was watching us. Not a soul. And we were hemorrhaging 100,000 viewers a year because of how dark the vision was. And so HBO, it was kind of like a Dread Pirate Roberts situation. HBO would come to us and say, well, we'll most likely kill you in the morning. But until then, go have at it because we have nothing to replace you with. So they left us alone, they let us do our work, and we were in heaven. We were just like, wow, we get no, we don't get many notes, we're left alone, uh, we can go as dark and as deep as we want. This is a writer's dream. Here's the anomaly. Why, why have I had three successful adaptations of my books? It's because of the auteur theory. Auteur, auteur, however you want to say it. Um, I'm from Boston, we always said ata, so I don't know how to deal with it after that. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, um, it's because the studios essentially left them alone. They, they understood the difference between art and commerce. They, they set low budgets. Once those budgets were set, it was let the filmmakers do what they want. Now, it helps if the filmmakers Clint Eastwood. So Clint Eastwood and Brian Helgeland wrote, locked the script for Mystic River, and that was it. It was never touched again. Um, the same thing happened on Gone Baby Gone. They said to Ben, they said, actually, we'll, Ben Affleck, they said, we'll give you a bigger budget if you change the ending. And he said, with all due respect, I'd rather not do that. They said, fine. Fine. We'll keep the budget low. Do your film. He did the film. He kept his ending. 
that I think is certainly why those films work artistically and aesthetically. I don't know all about commercially, you know. I do that artistically and aesthetically. Those films work because of the screenwriter director relationship and some great actors. I had nothing to do with any of that. Um, so I don't think that's a uh, I don't think it's a coincidence is, is how I'd put it. With the wire, it was just this wonderful situation in which we were we were all there for the right reason. We would have fights like you wouldn't believe. I mean, my God, we fought in that room, but it was all to the greater good. It was all about this this vision that we were we were trying to forge, and um, and so in the end, when all of a sudden people kind of caught up, and it, the wire didn't become the wire until it was going off the air. It was as it was going off the air, everybody said, "Oh well." That was a wonderful show, and I've been watching it since the beginning. And everybody ran out, and they, they rented the DVDs. Uh, trust me, I, I know. I get the checks. <laughs> it, it was the DVDs is where we made money. So um, we, we were allowed to just do this amazing piece of work. And, um, and then that led to being on the ground floor, what I consider the best narrative renaissance since New York playwriting in the 1950s. Yeah. Right now... Premium cable television is doing things that are far better at a pound per pound basis than anything going on in film, anything going on in theater, anything going on anywhere right now. It is the place to be. And I happen to just be in the ground floor because I did a job because my friend had a barn and he put on a show. I said to Clint, I said, look, this is not for sale. I just want you to know that. And Clint did this thing that he's very famous. Sean Penn told the same story. Brian Hugglin wrote the script, told the same story. Um, Clint just agrees with you. It's very Dale Carnegie. And he says, uh, he says, oh, no, I absolutely, I understand it's not for sale. But if it was, <laughs> that's what he does. And he just keeps you on the line. And he just wore me down over the course of like a week. And, the, and the, he just, I, I was expecting flowers at some point. He just kept calling me. And, the, you know, and then he, he, said, he said the magic words. He said, this is a tra he said, this is a classical tragedy. I get that. And we will not change it. Structurally, we will keep it the same. Do you want to do the script? And I remember this moment just knowing with complete certainty. I said, no. And he said, why? And I said, because I just busted my ass getting this to 401 pages. I would have no idea which darlings to murder to get it to 135. Please, let's just get a really great adapter. And we went out and we got Brian Helgeland. It was the beginning of me understanding that I made a really smart move. And... And from that point on, I've never, and I never will. I will never adapt one of my novels. I'll adapt somebody else's because I know how to be merciless with somebody else's. Um, and I'll adapt a, no a short story. The drop started as a short story called Animal Rescue because I can blow it up. But I, I would never know what to cut. And that's the thing. How would I know? You know, they don't let the greatest surgeon in the world would not be allowed to operate on his child because he has no perspective. So I got happened. I was lucky enough to catch that wave. I was lucky enough to be in there when there was a lot of cool stuff going on. I've been very lucky in general, and that's the other thing I would wish on all of you writers. Um, may you have luck, okay? Because it, it, everybody says, well, you worked real hard, you did all this. I know so many people who are just as good as me who are nowhere, who are bartenders in Key West now. It, luck plays a part. Hard work plays a part, too, and I will never back down from that either. Or, yeah, part of me deserves to be here. I busted my ass. But the other part is sometimes just being in the right place, the right time, the right epoch at the right time, the right moment to know when to grab the ring. Th th those are huge things in any artist's history. And, and, um, and I, wish, I wish it very fondly for all of you who are trying to do this and haven't gotten there yet. At the end of the day, when you, John L. West, like, w this was his line. I love it. When you write a novel, you're God. When you write a screenplay, you're God's tailor. Don't ask me why God's tailor gets paid more than God. That's just how it works out. But <laughs> when you write a novel, you are. You're God. You control every single thing. You control the atmosphere. I mean, you truly control everything. And, and it's a wonderful, satisfactory thing to get to the end of that road and see that book show up on a shelf. Nobody puts screenplays on shelves. You know, Richard Price said that to me once, and I went, wow. He's like, you know, I mean, I, Richard said, I would kill to be Paul Schrader and have written Raging Bull. But I bet Raging Bull's not on a shelf. You know what I mean? It's a weird, it's a weird difference. So uh, I like having the tactile thing of a book. So I'll always want that.